let's talk about what was probably the, the uh, first uh, energy producing system that uh, evolved. The thought is when the Earth first uh, Earth formed in the first primitive organisms, perhaps resembling a present day bacterium in some way, came out, there were a lot of organic compounds that had been made by lightning strikes and cosmic radiations triggering chemical reactions and so on. So it was, there was sort of food around, but they depleted those resources in the same way we're depleting the petroleum resources right now. If life was going to continue, somehow a way had to be found to, um, to, to make energy. Um, glycolysis is a, is a, a comp, it's a, it looks kind of complicated. It takes a molecule of sugar, and then there are a series of 10 chemical reactions, each catalyzed by a, um, a separate enzyme that give two molecules of this molecules of pyruvate. plus two ATPs, plus two NADHs, which tells you there must have been some kind of oxidation step as part of this sequence of events because electrons got taken off and got stashed on this, uh, on this NADH. Um, there are a couple of things that are important about this. One is it's, uh, it's a, it's a pathway. Uh, it evolved probably 3.7 billion years ago or sometime nobody really knows, but a long time ago. It's pretty much universal. Not perfectly so, but it's in bacteria. It's in yeast. It's in humans. And another uh, really important thing is that it evolved early in the evolution of Earth. So it evolved when there was no oxygen around. So it's a way of making energy from glucose in the absence of oxygen. So it's a really important uh, thing, as you'll see uh, as we go along. So um, if you, you're not going to have to memorize this, uh, this pathway. We'll give it to you if you need it. Uh, but you're going to need to understand its implications. And I just let me point out a couple of things. You're going to see a sequence of 10 chemical transformations that in the end are going to end up with a couple of pyruvates uh, being produced. And I'll try to <laughs> explain to you why, sh why should you care uh, about this. Um, but some, there's a concept that you're familiar with that if you're going to, uh, you want to make something and you get a little startup company, what's the very first thing you have to do? You actually have to make an investment before you can get going and you're out looking for venture capital things. Well, one of the odd things about this, here's probably the first sequence of reactions that, that arose on Earth in s within some organism that enabled that organism to make energy out of glucose. And look, the first thing that happens, trying to make ATP, but the very first thing it does is it spends an ATP. And it takes uh, glucose and it makes glucose 6 phosphate. Go down a couple of steps, there's an enzyme that takes another molecule of, uh, of ATP. And now you've got, uh, at this point, you're at fructose with two phosphates on it. And if this was your venture capital, you'd say, hey guys, you know, how about some product? Stop spending, stop spending money. Um, but at this point, then, this is a six carbon sugar. And it gets split into, oops, it doesn't quite fit on here, two six carbon, uh, two three carbon compounds that are going back and forth. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I can see it. It's over there. Okay. Um, that, are that are in equilibrium. Oh, I said we're getting clipped by this thing. Uh, we're equi uh, in equilibrium um, over here. And this particular three carbon compound then goes on uh, to, uh, to be oxidized, we get the production of NADH. And at that point, this molecule has a lot of energy stored in it 
And in the next transformation, the cell is able to make two ATPs and it gets back the initial investment. It goes all the way through the rest of the pathway and in the very last step, you get two more ATPs back. There is your, your net yield. So what, what you get out of this are four ATPs plus two NADH and your investment was two ATPs, so your net two ATPs plus NADH. Why is, why is the cell going and doing these initial investments? Well, if we look at the, free ener the changes in free energy associated with what's going on, there's glucose up in the upper left starting up there, and there's pyruvate down there. So you're going energetically downhill in the end. So this is a sequence of events that in principle you should be able to get some energy out of it. But for reasons that may seem obscure to you at this point, before it gets to the point of making energy, it undergoes a set of transformations that, that's pushing the reaction, requires the, the, the reactants to go energetically uphill, i.e. in an unfavorable direction. So what the cell does is it's by coupling ATP hydrolysis to this uh, step, it makes that reaction go. Here's another unfavorable one. It makes that one go by coupling ATP hydrolysis to it. Uh, this is an uphill uh, reaction, but look what over here. This is an immensely favorable reaction that goes essentially to completion. It goes all the way. So that means this product is just being continually taken out of the system. So the equilibrium is basically being pulled over the edge by the removal of that product. This is where the oxidation takes place. You get the NADH uh, made right there. And it's finally down here where you get to lose uh, this transformation uh, gives you two ATPs and later there's another one. Let me just sort of give you a sense of how the, why you get ATP at that step. Um, the, compound that you have at that point is 1,3-diphosphoglycerate. Uh, or sometimes this is called bis, is also used to describe this. But what this is, is this compound. It's a three-carbon compound. So glycerate is basically an oxidized version of glycerol that has been oxidized up to a carboxyl acid. So this is a mixed anhydride between a uh, carboxyl acid and a phosphate ion. So that, that's a very reactive and unstable compound. And the other thing that the cell has succeeded in doing by all of these transformations is it's got these two phosphates with all their negative charges. And so this is a compound that would very much like to move to a lower energy. And if you, if you, uh, so you can uh, get rid of this uh, phosphate and move to an energy level, use that energy to make ATP. And there's a similar kind of logic that explains why um, you get energy out of the final step when you look at it. So <laughs> this is, this is, there's several points, I guess, to, to make out of this. One is that it's a pathway. None of these reactions make any particular sense by themselves. You could have a cell that knew how to do one of them and it would gain nothing. It would just, unless you wanted to use the product to make, to make something. So these, uh, this thing only makes sense, these reactions only make sense in the context of this 10 step pathway. And as we, each step in this, that pathway we're looking at is catalyzed by a different enzyme. So for an organism to pull this off, the first one that did it had to collect in one cell all 10 of those enzymes. And probably there is the reason that this is such a complicated system. If you were sitting as a designer, you might be able to come up now with a more efficient way to get ATP out. But what happened evolutionarily was some bug somewhere 
got all of these things together and now suddenly it can make energy. So it had a huge advantage over everybody else. And once it took over, uh, that system took over, then it became sort of uh, universal. Whether it was the best that ever could be designed, it doesn't matter because it had an evolutionary edge. And that's so, to some extent, we're looking at a living, a living fossil biochemical, but it's in bacteria, it's in yeast, and it's going on inside of our, uh, inside of our body. Another principle that uh, I think you can see here, which I've been trying to sort of say, is in this case, the energy producing, the energy consuming reactions are driven by coupling them to the hydrolysis of ATP. The cell spends a bit of its energy money to get these intermediates, knowing that it's invest, well, not knowing, but at least uh, conceptually anyway, knowing that uh, it's going to get them back, get its uh, investment uh, back. And then the, uh, en the reactions that release energy are used to drive uh, the synthesis of ATP. And you'll begin to see, uh, we're going to just um, talk about some other aspects of this um, in just a minute. So, what do you think? You're the first bug, and you've got this, and nobody else can do it, so you can start charging away. I'll, what do we need to do? We just let this thing cycle away, the stuff that I had up there. Is it going to work? There's a problem. Anybody see what the problem is? Making two molecules ATP and two molecules NADH. Talk to the person beside you. See, figure out why something else has to happen. Go ahead. You got any ideas? for the moment, I, I don't think this process could have in, invented ATP. It had to have been around because many of the enzymes used it. What else is being used in this thing, though? I hear it, NAD. So what, if, to make this thing work, I have to keep taking NADs out of my pocket and putting it in the reaction, or it isn't going to go anywhere. So this isn't such a great invention at the moment. <laughs> we have to do something to get the NADH back to NAD+, plus so we can do another molecule of glucose. You guys see, do you see this? This is really, really an important consideration. So in order for cells to make, um, make energy using the glycolysis, in the absence of oxygen, which is when it evolved, they have to do something with that NADH, or it's only going to do a, you know, use up all the, the few molecules of NAD plus in the cell, and then it stops. And so there are two ways uh, that nature's figured, major ways nature's figured out how to do that. So here's the molecule of, uh, of pyruvate. I've got an extra something that's nagging at me when I did this here. Mm. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's always hard to see things when you're up the board. Okay, molecule of pyruvate. There's a couple of solutions that have been arrived at. One is to take NADH, two NADHs. Is 2H pluses convert make these uh, back into 2NAD plus and to take those electrons and put them on the pyruvate to give this molecule which is lactic acid so by parking the electrons there, the cell is able to recycle the NADH. 
Uh, and lactic acid, uh, we've run into that. That's why I gave you, showed you this picture. Yogurt, uh, the lactobacilli that make yogurt take the sugars that are present in milk and make them into lactic acid. And what's interesting in their case is they, even though there's oxygen around, they don't do respiration, which you'll see you can get more energy. They want it to get very acidic because, and, uh, because that prevents their competitors from growing. And that's why you can leave yogurt sitting out on the tabletop and it'll be okay for quite a while. Whereas if you left some milk or something, it'll go bad almost uh, right away. Um, here's another example of when we run into it. When we do hard aerobic exercise, when you're running or skating really hard, things you see in the Olympics all the time, you exhaust the, uh, you deplete the oxygen supply in your blood when you do hard anaerobic exercise. And so the cells have the same problem of regenerating NADH. The way they solve it is they make lactic acid and that contributes to the sore muscles you feel after you've done hard, uh, hard uh, uh, anaerobic training. The other way of handling this is to take the two NADH plus two hydrogen ions, to, to make it into acetaldehyde, two acetaldehydes, plus two CO2s. Oops, excuse me. To do this first, and then take the two NADH plus the two H plus, convert this to 2NAD plus, and what we get out of this are two molecules of ethanol plus two molecules of CO2. Uh, again, a, uh, a process that's very similar to you, when, familiar to you when I was showing you yeast growing. What yeast is doing is it's carrying out glycolysis and then it's taking those extra electrons, putting them on the pyruvate and making uh, ethanol and carbon dioxide. Um, I think in, there's a fermentation with what we call a fermentation with yeast. I think in that case they're making bourbon whiskey, uh, wine making, beer making. It's all the same thing. You have uh, yeast, you're converting the sugars first to pyruvate and then making them into ethanol, ethanol and carboxylic, um, carboxylic acid. So anyway, there's no uh, energy gain out of this, but it, it's, these are important processes. They're called fermentation. And they can happen when there's no oxygen around. If you recall, the, there's a, oops, a version of, um, of photosynthesis that what I called the second sort of release of photosynthesis it began to evolve oxygen as a waste product. And then over the next uh, ensuing uh, millennia, the levels of oxygen slowly, slowly began to rise on Earth. And as oxygen levels got to higher levels, and recall down at the Cambrian period, which is down on the fourth uh, um, blackboard down there, we were only still, even there uh, half a billion years ago, we were only about 5% the present oxygen levels. But as it became, oxygen levels um, arose, new metabolic opportunities uh, became available. And in particular, cells were able to get at that energy which is stored in NADH. In the absence of oxygen, NADH is just a nuisance. You gotta get rid of it. But as you'll see in a minute, you can do something interesting if you have oxygen around. So just to look at this from a broad perspective, if we have glucose and we have all these little steps going along to give the two pyruvate. If there's, if there's, in the absence of oxygen, we either get two lactate or we can get two ethanol, uh, two CO2, in both cases, two ATP, two ATP, these processes happening in the absence of oxygen to get 
rid of the, or at least not requiring oxygen in any case, uh, called fermentations. However, when oxygen, oxygen is available, it became possible to evolve a new system for handling these pyruvates. The go into a site, a biochemical cycle known as the citric acid cycle, and I'll say a word about this in a minute, plus uh, something else that's known as um, oxidative phosphorylation. This is also referred to as the respiratory chain. And what this, these two sets of processes together enable the cell to take this, uh, these two three carbon compounds and take them all the way down to six molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of water, and to make a net yield of 36 molecules of ATP. So if you go by fermentation, a molecule of sugar gives you two ATPs. If you go by glycolysis and then follow it by respiration, you get 36. So respiration using oxygen, 18 times more efficient than, um, than uh, by glycolysis. So in order to understand how this works, though, we have to consider, uh, we have to talk more about how you f change uh, from one form of energy to another. And it's interesting, although this process had to have evolved billions of years ago, it was only relatively recently that we understood uh, the principle that was necessary for this, this kind of thing to happen. It's known as the chemiosmotic hypothesis. It was proposed by Peter Mitchell in 1961. He eventually got a Nobel Prize for it. It took a, quite a long time took more than 10 years for it to, to be accepted. In fact, when I was in grad school, people were still, in the mid-70s, people were still arguing whether this made sense or not. Uh, so here's the way it works. We have to consider first three different forms of chemical energy that can be all in interconverted. One of them is familiar to you. We've been talking about it all along. It's a chemical bond. Energy can be stored in that high energy bond. And if we break it, to give ADP and inorganic phosphate, we can release energy. However, there's another way of storing energy as a concentration gradient. The principle here would be to have a barrier, which in this case is the cell membrane, and to have a high concentration of whatever it is on one side and a low concentration on the other side, and there's energy stored in that. If you give it a chance, it'll get to be the same concentration on both sides. And the trick is to have whatever the substance is, is to have a, a protein in the, um, in the membrane that can permit this, uh, this thing to go across in a controlled fashion. The third form is electrical potential. Again, the membrane actually acts as an insulator. And all cells, if this is the inside and this is the outside, There's a gradient of hydrogen ions, so there are more uh, hydrogen ions outside the cell than there are inside. So it 
creates um, an, electri uh, an electrical uh, potential, and these can't cross the membrane unless, guess what? There's a protein in the membrane that's able to permit their passage under controlled circumstances. So there's basically three different forms of, of energy that can be interconverted. And, and Peter Mitchell's great insight, which I will say was not intuitive uh, for many people, was the combination, so the combo of this proton concentration gradient plus the electrical potential could be used to drive the synthesis of ATP. And let me just say a couple of words, because this, this may sort of feel, how could this be? Could you really have energy? Well, the electrical, the potential across a cell is about 70 millivolts. May not seem all that much. But remember, the membrane is about 3 nanometers thick. So that's about 200,000 volts per centimeter. High tension wires are, I don't know, 200,000 volts per mile or something. It's very, there's a lot of power in there. And furthermore, uh, let's see if I can bring this up. I've been showing you this. Uh, little movie a couple, couple of times, the bacteria with these little nanomotors that are spinning those flagella, and we saw how they, there's this machinery that's a little nanomotor. You know how it's powered? It's powered by the proton gradient. A proton trickles away its way through, from, through this apparatus from the outside to the inside. It's coming down the gradient. That's the source of the power. And as I showed you, it's a pretty powerful motor. You can gl basically glue the propeller to a, a slide, and it can twirl the bacteria all around. In fact, one of my sort of favorite uh, demos is uh, years ago, people took a bacterium, and they managed to pop it open. So all the cytoplasm, all the stuff on the inside uh, sort of flew, uh, came out of the cell, and you just got buffer on the inside. But it had these flagella, so you had just the shells of bacteria with, the, um, uh, with nothing really <laughs> inside them. But if you add a drop of acid to this media, now you've created a proton gradient with more uh, protons on the outside than are on the inside. And guess what happens? The flagellar motor starts working, and the, the bacteria start swimming, even though all they are sort of talk about dead men walking or something like that. It gives you an idea of the power of the, uh, that's in this proton uh, combination of the uh, proton um, gradient and the, constant and the electric potential. The combination of this is often referred to as the proton motive force. So here's the principle of how this, the cell is able to exploit that, and this is what underlies uh, respiration. There's, there are two stages. Stage one, there's a membrane with some kind of membrane protein uh, in it, which is actually a proton, func functions as a proton pump. So it's a protein that's designed to be embedded into a membrane and to, and to work there. This, is, this part here is the membrane itself. The proton gets transported from the inside to the outside when energy is put into this proton pump. So in response, to some energy producing event, the cell pumps 
protons from its inside to its outside, and this then establishes the, the proton gradient. The second phase then is to is to take advantage of that proton gradient, and there's a different protein embedded in the membrane. It's known as an ATP synthase, and it permits a proton to come down the, down the gradient, which you would want to do. But if that's all that happened, all you do is you just dissipate your gradient. So the key here is that this proton is only allowed to come down the gradient to the energetically more favorable side if ADP and uh, inorganic phosphate are bound to this ATP synthesis. And the dropping of the proton down the gradient's passage through this ATP synthesis, uh, synthase, which is an energy favorable reaction, drives the synthesis of uh, ATP. And there's, this is uh, so much energy is basically given off with this. You can make an ATP, and the thing will, and the thing will still go. Now, interestingly, this this ATP synthase, which really lies at the heart of uh, the, our energetics for how we function as uh, as as human beings, is derived from. It looks like looks like th this is its, sorry. Whoops. It's crystal structure, but in fact, evolutionarily, it's related to that flagellar motor. So probably, and as that proton comes down the gradient, or actually this is presented upside down, so there's the outside as it goes through in this direction, the ATP synthes synthase, which is known as the F1, F0, ATP synthase uh, rotates, uh, and probably this came first. It's a little hard in this one because you don't have the flagella, so what scientists have done is they've been able to attach something like an actin filament onto this F1 ATP uh, synthase and show that as proton passage, passages, the thing rotates. So in all likelihood, uh, what happened in evolution was this came first, and then later, the gene got or the machinery got duplicated and evolved to become a nanomotor. And as I told you the other day, that apparatus <laughs> for the flagellar motor got evolved again into becoming a little syringe that bacteria like uh, uh, Yersinia are able to um, to use to pump pro to squeeze proteins from squirt proteins from inside them into inside of um, of uh, mammalian cell. Okay, well, thanks to this, this work by uh, Peter Mitchell then, we can now understand uh, how cells were able to take advantage of that energy that was in the NADH. This is the process is known as respiration, and basically it's taking uh, the Two NADH. I'm supposed to see the physical therapist today, so I hope we're going to begin to make progress to lecturing on two feet sooner or later. <laughs> plus two NAD pluses plus two uh, two water. So, as I said, NADH earlier, NADH and protons. It's basically hydrogen. It's the equivalent of having hydrogen gas and adding oxygen, and we're burning the hydrogen gas down to, to water. So there's a lot to yield water. So there's a lot of energy potentially can be given off. That's the 50 kcals per, um, uh, per mole. Now, if you recall when we talked about thermodynamics, that the, so the NADH is up is up here. By the time we get down, 
by the time we get down to the two NAD pluses plus the water, the two waters, energetically, we're down here, and this is about a free energy change of about 50 kcals per mole. In physiological terms, that's a huge amount of energy. And I think some of the textbooks uh, compare it to like letting a stick of dynamite off inside of a cell. So it's really more than biology is able, figured out how to handle this in a single step. But do you remember that important principle about a thermodynamic uh, property when I had the little picture of the skier? It doesn't matter which pathway you take, you get the same amount of energy released whether you go down the black diamond slope or you go down the bunny slope. So in fact, the way uh, biology uh, has learned, life has learned to control this amount of energy is basically taking the sort of bunny slope. And so the energy drop occurs in a s uh, series of um, stages where you have the transfer of two electrons to a lower state intermediate, transfer of two electrons to another one, transfer of two electrons to another one. And where this connects with the stuff that I just told you is as these two electrons are coming down, what's happening is a proton is being pumped from the inside to the outside as it moves to the next lower energy state, another proton gets pumped from the inside to the outside, and the same thing happens here. So at the end, you get the, um, the two hydrogens plus the half the half of an oxygen and we get a water molecule from these two electrons. But what's been, what's happened is these three protons have changed from inside to outside. That enables the cell to make three ATPs. So now instead of throwing away all that, all that energy that was in the NADH is in the fermentations, the cell is extracting energy out of it by taking advantage of this uh, principle of the uh, proton gradient. So the game changes uh, if you're an des evolutionary designer <laughs> or something. If you're trying to think, if you were trying to des design life from, from first principles now, you could take advantage of this. Well, of course, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, experiments happen all the time in nature and some thing happens and sometimes it's very efficient, sometimes it isn't, but if it's there first, it gets going. Uh, in this case, um, the, the need now or the opportunity was that if an organism could make more, any, get more NADH out of, that, uh, out of that original molecule of glucose, it could make more energy than somebody else. And so the ultimate way to get rid of, uh, to take a molecule of glucose is you, if you burn it with oxygen, you end up with six carbon dioxides and water. You burn it all away. So there's a system that in, in essence does that. It's known as the citric acid cycle. So you have the pyruvate that comes from, that comes from glycolysis and the way it's processed is first uh, one of the, the carboxyl group on the pyruvate is released, and this produces acetyl, excuse me, that you can look to see what CoA at the moment, it doesn't matter. What doesn't matter is this is a three carbon compound. Acetyl, as you probably know, is a two carbon compound. And when you look in your textbooks at the citric acid cycle, you'll see this very confusing circle with lots of uh, compounds and, uh, and um, enzymes and stuff. But I want you to just keep your eye on the ball here. If you'll notice, the, com the compound over here is in the cycle is four carbons. And what happens is this two carbon compound that was derived from pyruvate gets added to this to give a six carbon compound. And then that gets converted to a five carbon compound with a molecule of CO2 
being given off. That in turn gets converted to a four carbon compound with another molecule of CO2 given off. And then there's some molecular gymnastics here that change the, the, the nature of the, the four carbon compound a bit so you can get back into the, back into the cycle. But look what's happened to those um, three carbons that were in the pyruvate. There's one of them. There's the other one. There's the other one. So this citric acid cycle produces, it actually makes some ATP, but it makes quite a bit of NADH, and it also makes another uh, one more reduced electron carrier. It's not NADH, it's another one that's used in the cell. But anyway, the cell is then able to take all of uh, this NADH and this electron carrier plus these to give you what I'd said, the net yield you get from respiration, 36 ATPs from a single, from a single molecule of glucose. So it's sort of quite remarkable to some extent. It's sort of, I've, we're kind of looking at evolution through, if you will, almost like looking at biochemical fossils and then when something works, uh, it, it's a living fossil, it, we still find it uh, in our in our cells.